Perfect. So I think I've started recording um, and you should be able to hear me fine. So hi, my name is Nigel Douglas. I'm a solutions architect here at Tigera. And today I'm going to focus on um, uh, specifically network policy implementation with respect to Project Calico. So for today's session, we are going to focus on the policy implementation. For those who are, let's say, unfamiliar with Project Calico um, or starting off with it recently, um, Calico as an open source project is split up into really three functionality. So there's the CNI plugin, so the container networking interface. Um, CNI, for again, those who are trying to understand this, it's responsible for setting up the networking um, between your containers, adding IP addresses um, for those containers. Um, now, there's also the IP allocation management piece, the IPAM plugin. Um, as you can imagine, this plugin is responsible for creating um, or assigning um, the IP addresses for those pods. Although these two pieces are fundamental for container networking, um, they're not actually relevant to today's session. So the agent we're going to focus on here is Felix. Um, as you can see in the architectural diagram I've got in front of me, um, Felix is what the agent that's responsible for speaking with um, IP tables for the policy implementation. So um, Felix is responsible for calculating and enforcing um, network policies seen in this presentation, as I just said there a second ago. Um, it will use standard Linux control plane implementation with kube proxy. Um, we do also support eBBF without using kube proxy. That's worth noting. Um, and this updates IP tables for you. So this is just a high level view of architecture with the product. If you are looking to learn more about the architecture of the open source project, um, my colleague Casey, um, who's a maintainer of Project Calico, actually has the video uploaded at tigera.io forward slash video forward slash tigera dash calico dash fundamentals. Um, definitely recommend checking it out um, so we can go into that later. But for this session, we're going to assume you've now you're using well pretty much any CNI implementation and you've decided, yeah, for CNI, you could be using a bunch of different plugins, but we're going to focus on um, network policy implementation. So why do we need network policy? Um, Kubernetes essentially is a flat network. So what this means is that the pods on those nodes can freely talk to other pods across other nodes without the use of network address translation. Um, so on day one, when you set up a cluster, pods are incredibly insecure. They're freely talking amongst each other and there's no guardrails essentially configured in this case. Um, they're also ephemeral. So what I mean by this is pods don't have a fixed IP that's going to last very long because Kubernetes itself is highly scalable. Uh, pods are brought up and torn down regularly. And IPs, uh, again, the IPAM plugin that I quickly went over a second ago is responsible for assigning the IP addresses for those pods. So we need something that is essentially deterministic. Because of the particle locations being non-deterministic, we need something static. Um, and in this case, we will talk about label selectors as that Kubernetes-specific abstraction layer um, by which we can build policy around something that is somewhat fixed. Um, so again, as the pods scale up and down, as long as they have label schema built around them, then policy is dynamic. It doesn't have to worry about the IP address changing. And if, in fact, we're not going to build policy around IP address specifically. Um, so the network policy is the primary tool to secure Kubernetes. Traditional applications, let's say you're making a migration over from um, a traditional monolithic architecture. Uh, what I mean by that is you kind of have like a, you know, a server hosting a front end application, maybe the back end being a Microsoft SQL uh, back end database. Um, but in this case, we've got microservices. So it's a kind of a cloud native or microservice architecture. Um, and in this case, you know, traditionally the firewall was great because you had a static IP usually associated with that host, that server that was hosting the application. It was very easy to build perimeter based ruling to say, allow these ports and protocols over these IPs to this destination. When in reality with Kubernetes, because of it being highly dynamic, and as we mentioned there, pods being ephemeral, um, it's not going to be something we can work with long-term uh, with IP. So we're not even going to focus on using a traditional firewall implementation. We're going to use policy or network policy as an uh, alternative to your traditional firewalls. Um, 
also, whether we're talking about Project Calico or the Kubernetes default network policy implementation, it uses standard policy API. And this is going to be relevant throughout our session. So yeah, these are the three things I just want to focus on when we're talking about policy, whether it be, again, Calico's policy or the default Kubernetes policy, um, is that we are trying to identify what context we're going to uh, select for policy uh, rules based on key pair values. So those will be the labels you'll usually have, as you see in the picture, um, owner equals Nigel or um, distribution or platform equals, you know, GKE. Now we're not going to talk about making rules on a platform perspective. So let's say I could have um, type equals front end or type equals back end. Then we know which pods are assigned to those key var value pairs. So those labels, and those again are going to be static regardless again of the pods being scaled up or down and the IPs being reassigned on those. Since it's declarative, we're essentially declaring once we scope it to those labels, then apply these actions on it. And since the environment is highly dynamic in by nature, Kubernetes is designed to be dynamic, our policy needs to be dynamic with that. So we shouldn't have to continuously revise network policy we, that we would have done with traditional firewalls. If we're IP based, we'd have to keep changing those rules. We want it so that once we have those guardrails defined, especially again, default denies, we'll talk about that in a while. So that even as new workloads get introduced, ones that we're not even familiar with with a label-based schema, they would be captured by these catch-alls. And again, that is a similar concept to firewalling, um, but we're going to apply that to network policy. So it has to stay dynamic. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll stick to that first point there uh, about labels. So labels is not a Calico specific uh, concept. This is a Kubernetes um, concept. You can see the source link there to Kubernetes.io if you want to find out more about how it works. But as you see from the example, it is essentially key value pairs. Um, so what are key value pairs? Like I say, it's usually um, you know, a concept, something that you want to focus on, a purpose, an intention, and then the associated value with that. So if it's ownership or organizational structure, define that as the value and then or the, the pair and or the key, and then you want to assign a relevant value to that. So each key must be unique for a given object. Um, and that way, once we have that unique nature, then it's very easy for us to say, again, we'd create a schema. We strongly recommend defining a kind of a, a, a label schema so you understand the intentions, the purpose of your your workloads going forward, and it'll be so much easier for us to build network policy around that. So here's an example. If we didn't use Calico, we have um, an API version coming from networking.k8.io, so it's the standard Kubernetes uh, API. Uh, the kind is network policy, so that is what we're making right now. It's a CRD called network policy. I've given it a name called my network policy. It's a simple name because that's what it is. Um, you it. By default in Kubernetes, the, the structure is that they're scoped to a namespace. So you have to define a specific namespace and then whatever pods reside inside that network namespace, then we're going to specify the, what we actually want to scope. So under the specification, we're looking for pod selectors. Those selectors are matched labels. And as we saw there about the key value pair, it's role equals DB. So if you assign a label to a database and you call it role, the intention, and then we say, well, the intended pod is going to be a database, then say role equals DB. In this case, any time a new database or a change just happens to those DBs, no matter how many pods there might be, anything with that matching label, this policy will apply to it. And in this case, it's only scoping action that is ingress, received traffic to the pods. So you see ingress from other pods that have pod selectors matching the label role equals front end. Now that's a very simple logic. It is very structured. It is um, again, declarative. So we're saying anything with the role of DB, then it can receive traffic from front end. But notice how the example of the other role, which was the role equals helper, because we never scoped that into our rule condition. It means even if a new workload came along and he had a different role, it would be automatically denied. And also I didn't clarify that, was we only allowed specifically TCP 6379 for that um, DB to talk to the front end. So anything else would be ultimately denied or receive traffic from the front end, I should say. Now, 
with these, um, we'll go over kind of a crossover between network policy with Kubernetes and obviously the advantages of using Calico's policy implementation. But the next bit I'm just going to specify is via an IP block. So I mentioned briefly earlier, we don't build policy based on IP. That's not necessarily true. Like there might be an example where you want to say, allow a pod to talk to public internet, you know, or a specific range of IPs that you want to declare. And in that case, you can absolutely declare, here's my IP block, specify the side range, and then say, am I going to allow traffic to, as we saw there, um, 172.18.0.0 over the 24 um, CIDR um, range, then you can absolutely say, allow that and that anything else that doesn't isn't part of the IP block will obviously be denied. But what we want to do is not focus on policy for workloads based on IP. We want to keep to that label idea of something that's static. But of course, you can build policy around um, IPs. And of course, it's relevant when you're declaring what are the, again, ranges that I should be allowed to talk to. And as you can see from this example, it's saying anything with the label construct is now allowing egress to talk out to those IP ranges. So this is only an egress action. The previous one was to receive from, so that was an ingress action. Now, some organizations don't do it. I strongly recommend everyone should have this implemented in an organization. Um, it is the simplest guardrail you can organize, but again, it's all based on you already enforcing zero trust. And this is what we call a default deny. So a default deny is essentially saying, I've scoped both ingress and egress actions. So as we said, it's still a Kubernetes network policy. So it's using API version network policy.ka.io. This will work for both Kubernetes, as you can see here, as well as Calico. But I'm specifying for all my ingress and egress action, I'm matching quite literally every um, label selection I could find for those pod selectors. Um, so regardless of workload, it's going to deny it because I've enabled the action. It's looking for something to do because I never gave it anything. Um, I didn't declare uh, something for it to specifically do, then it's not um, exclusively or explicitly denying the traffic, it's um, implicitly denying the traffic. So regardless of new workloads that get introduced, whether they're permitted or um, rogue, so someone tried introducing the cluster, they will automatically be denied. So how this would work is we would implement zero trust, and I'll try and explain that in this session, about only allowing the traffic you actually would permit in your environment. And sometimes you can be a bit broad with it, but certainly try to be as granular as you can. And once those workloads are freely talking over the ports and protocols that you do permit, then as long as this default deny sits at the end of every namespace or potentially a global rule, which we'll talk on in a while, then any new unwanted traffic will automatically be captured. It's a very um, powerful um, policy and quite simple to implement as we can see here. But it can be dangerous if you implement this in the beginning without putting ser uh, serious uh, thought into zero trust, because you'll end up denying traffic that you actually would otherwise wish to permit. Um, so yeah, here's some kind of um, ideas around Calico's network policy. I've only shown you Kubernetes so far, so it's important to know what are the advantages of using Calico's implementation. So it's an extension on the Kubernetes network policy implementation. It's not... Um, an alternative way of looking at it, it takes the exact same structure that we're familiar with. So if you're already using Kubernetes, but you would like some additional capabilities, then do that. You know, I strongly recommend using it. As you can see here, um, it requires Calico for policy. So we talked about the Felix agent in the architectural diagram. It's not necessarily as the CNI. So even if you're using AWS VPC CNI on an EKS cluster, or you're using um, Azure's um, CNI, they, you know, they have their own CNI. So there's a bunch of different CNIs you could use, but that shouldn't affect using Calico um, for the network policy implementation. That should be a separate logic here. Um, another thing is when we looked at the examples of the policy, um, we actually can define explicit um, ordering or precedence of our policies within um, Calico. So you can say, read this policy before these policies again, globally or in a namespace, so that we know this is higher precedence. It's more important to have security actions enforced before the um, zero trust starts implementing on a per application level. Um, all Kubernetes network policies are namespace scoped. That's perfect in most cases. However, 
as an example, I want to implement a high level security rule. So I want to say deny traffic associated with known bad IPs or to known bad actors, or even around, say, the, the default deny, even though in this case, default deny makes more sense this way. You don't want to keep building identical replicated actions um, for each namespace because it just takes time. You have to keep building new policy implementation. And if you have dozens of namespaces, you're replicating the rule across all of those namespaces. So Calico also offers a globally scoped policy rule. That way, if we know there's a known bad actor or we want to build a quarantining rule to deny all traffic associated with a specific bad actor, then I wouldn't have to keep replicating the same rule for each namespace. I can say, apply it with this globally scoped. Um, so it'd be called a global network policy uh, as a CRD. And then within that object, you can then filter down for here is the scope of that context, even though it's a global rule. Um, that's really powerful. And I'll show some examples for that in a while. And uh, within Kubernetes, it is explicitly just allowing traffic. So as I said, with the default deny, you allow the traffic you want, anything that wasn't what you do permit, catch it through default deny, implicitly deny it. Whereas in this case, you can explicitly use an action to deny. You can also explicitly pass and log traffic. And why um, logging is quite good on, alongside denying is, it, as the example I mentioned there, a quarantine rule. So you're saying anything that matches these contexts, we know we otherwise would never trust, like it might be talk, a communication between certain pods that are doing certain actions, then you quarantine it. So you action it to say, deny all traffic from this pod to this other location. But then you could also say, well, log it. So that way you're forwarding a syslog message to notify yourself via a centralized SIM solution that there is some unusual activity based on the fact that we created a rule that says deny that action. So we obviously don't want it. So we want to be uh, dynamically ahead of it. So we're outright going ahead and trying to deny unwanted traffic, but also logging it. So we notify ourselves that there's some unusual actor there. Um, I'll try to go through this a little quicker. So we allow you to scope down per endpoint namespace, as you can imagine, but also service counts. And when you're trying to enforce things like PCI compliance, then if there's a user that shouldn't be permitted to access, for instance, workloads that handle payment details, then perfect. Allow them to define um, service account, like the, the user account, into the context of the uh, policy to say, well, don't allow this service account to talk to this one. And again, I'll show this example earlier. By default, we're handling layer five to you know layer three, layer four, you know, network traffic up to layer five. Um, we integrate nicely with projects like Envoy and Istio as a service mesh. So if we use the Envoy daemon set, then we have the ability also to collect layer seven traffic and similarly build network policy around not just the network specific traffic, but also the application layer, the HTTPS traffic that we would otherwise be logging through layer seven. Um, and this is probably my most interesting part that I get excited about is we're not just building policy around uh, workloads like we talk about with the Kubernetes implementation. We can create what we call host endpoints. So you can, in the Felix configuration, you can uh, ask for it to, um, or you can flag it to uh, automatically create host endpoints associated with your nodes in your cluster. And those nodes, then we can build policy around them to say, just like workload, uh, like the pods, to say, allow this or deny this traffic for those hosts. So you might have a specific use case where you have an etcd host and you want to again allow or deny that traffic perfect you know allow those specific ports or deny specific ports for that host endpoint and uh, i'll show a good example in a while for why host endpoint is quite powerful um it again it's just like the kubernetes implementation you can use kubectl to apply dash f on any yaml manifest as long as you're using the correct kinds and using the correct api version it's going to work. We also offer our own Calico CTL. I think as time moves on, we're probably going to deprecate that as most people use kubectl universally for different um, frameworks, not just with Calico. So I guess everyone has a preference to continue using kubectl. Um, again, if you use our enterprise technology, I'm not here to <laughs> sell enterprise to a community. It's just worth noting that if you use enterprise, uh, there is even further extensions like the ability to specify DNS policy on egress level to say, you know, don't just allow 
um, it to talk to these IP address like we talked about, but also whitelist or blocklist this specific, you know, wildcard.domain.com. And that way, again, a further abstraction rather than just focusing on IP, we can now do with DNS. But this is something you cannot do in Kubernetes policy implementation. There's this concept of tiering and preview and staging, all really useful if you want to have better understanding of is the policy going to work or I want to set stronger guardrails around it. But open source with the policy implementation, as you can see from the top, there are so many added capabilities. We should be able to address those on the session. So here is a Calico network policy. As you can see, it's highlighted for projectcalico.org is the API version we're dealing with. It has the same kind. So it's a network scope or namespace scoped network policy. The order value, as I mentioned earlier, it's saying the precedence of the policy. So order 900 uh, comes after order 800 or after order 700. So you know it's further down the chain. Um, it's also scoping the same way as we did earlier under specification, we say selector based on the label role assigned to it. But here's the bits that are different for um, Calico that we didn't see earlier. You can specify action, explicit actions. So we never mentioned actions earlier because it was only allow. So in this case, we can say, well, I would permit certain ports and protocols, but I would never allow TCP. Or in this case where I'm trying to do, uh, I don't permit certain service counts. Well, then I could say deny ingress. So I'm not allowing to receive traffic that is TCP from the source where it's a service count with the name SRE account. And the graph on the right should, or the diagram on the graph should give a better idea of that. So the service account, SRE account, he cannot talk or she cannot talk to any workload that has the label role equals helper over TCP. However, in the case of the second action, we are also focusing on logging ICMP traffic that's coming from the source with a name, say, selector color equals green. So notice how you can be quite broad. Um, I'm just, it, it, this isn't a really a, a powerful example. It's just to show how flexible it is. So you can not just allow, you can explicitly deny. We also allow service count context. You can log, which is brilliant if you're forwarding to a, a syslog or a SIM solution. And then you have ICMP amongst other protocols. So it's not just TCP, UDP, ICMP, like ping scanning. We can also log, deny, allow that traffic. So yeah, I'm going to try and show a real world example of what you might do with a traditional firewalling tool. So in a monolith architecture, you would have a zone-based architecture uh, is what they often try to create. So you create a demilitarized zone or a DMZ. It means that those pods, as long as they have the label context for, you know, um, again, we're not basing it on IP. We want to do this based on label. So we say, if it has the label FW zone equals DMZ, then it is categorized as a demilitarized zone workload. What do I mean by that? As you can see in the diagram, they should be pods that can talk to the public internet and also receive traffic from the public internet. So there's in this example, there looks like there's four Kubernetes pods in that DMC. They can talk to public internet and they will have a labels concept of or construct of firewall zones DMC. Now, as you can see, the trusted pod should be able to talk to DMZ. Um, I think the diagram should better explain that it's also allowed to receive traffic from DMZ. But the point here is that trusted zone by no means can talk directly to internet in the same way the restricted zone cannot talk to it. So what we're ultimately trying to do is we're not really concerned with trusted pods. What we are concerned with is we want to ensure that only permitted pods can talk for permitted purposes that we've approved. And by having strength and depth, it means that, well, it would be near impossible for us to get a compromised workload into the restricted zone where all the personally identifiable data is. So like, keep in mind, we're trying to comply with PCI or HIPAA or SOC2. And we want to make sure that if we have sensitive data, whether it be payment details or other PII data in that Oracle DB example, that backend pod, that it can only talk to trusted or permitted pods over trusted permitted ports and protocols where implying zero trust. And only then will the trusted pod be able to relay that data onto a DMZ, which now can talk to public internet. So the DMZ essentially has no visibility within the zone. There's large IPs between those zones. So with traditional firewalls, you would have 
three firewall zones. Again, it's a lot of context here. So we need to make it static. So as those workloads go up and down, I don't have to keep rebuilding the structure. Uh, we need it to be highly dynamic. And then those pods, otherwise, you know, if we didn't create this, they would have full lateral access between those zones. So there's nothing, no, nothing to stop a compromised workload if it did get into that unidentified DMZ zone from talking straight to a restricted DB. Stealing personally identifiable data, even if it was just doing port scanning, once it's got that data, if it gets away with it, then it can reach out to a command and control server and do whatever it wants because it can talk to public internet. So that's why we absolutely need these zones. So as I say, large IP ranges for egress, and then you have a bunch of different tools, as you can see from the example that they need to talk to. And maybe the trusted pods or the DMZ, yeah, probably the front end pod needs to access those external endpoints, or maybe the trusted pods need to. So we will make certain exceptions to the rule. We'll say only allowed to talk to DMZ unless it talks to external endpoints. Um, and again, we need to identify exactly what endpoint we're opening it up to, not opening up DNS to potentially anywhere. So that's why we may mention earlier about the DNS egress rules are really useful in Calico Enterprise. So um, I have an example um, you know, that I can share. Actually, you can go to docs.calicocloud.io if you're interested in it. But it's um, an application called Storefront. It's pretty standard. It's got a front end, uh, two microservices. So they're in the trusted zone and a back end and a logging component. You know, you have a standard logging tool, but that's also holding sensitive data. And within those zones, we notice that someone may introduce a rogue workload. Like we have to assume that someone's capable of compromising our cluster. So if they do compromise it, they perform TCP port scanning, some data exfiltration, then they're going to try and reach out to a command and control server to relay that data that they've otherwise uh, taken from our backend pods. So we are building the zones. We're building a DMZ trusted and restricted so that the blast radius in this case is far more restricted because as you see, the rogue workload managed to get into the restricted zone, but it can't talk outside the zone because we've really set no, like zero trust to the outside. The only way the data could have got to a different zone is over permitted ports and protocols only from a backend or logging pod to those other intermediary workloads. So in this case, um, we need to lock down not just north, south, traditional firewall can do that, but the east, west traffic is where it gets complicated. As I mentioned, staging the different environments. We can talk about that in a while, but it's important to understand within this tenant that um, I have, like I say there, a front end. I have a screenshot from a Google Cloud environment that I run, and you can see I have a front end pod, a back end, two microservices, and they have those labels. So when you say kubectl I'll get pods within the namespace storefront where the application is running, dash dash show dash labels. So I want to see the labels associated with it. Now you won't have a structured label schema by default. You may have something similar to what you can see there where you have a generic pod template hash value assigned to it, or maybe just app equals intention. That can be okay. But when you're building zone structure, it's good to also add additional labels like I've done here where you say FW zone is equal to DMZ trusted or restricted. And once you have those labels, it's very easy to build a policy like I've done here. Now I just realized there's a, <laughs> One slight thing to mention why this policy is different to the other one is because it's you it originated from Calico Enterprise. So it has, for instance, this concept of tiering. So you have product tier. Um, so the tier is called product. Uh, again, it's another abstraction associated with enterprise. So in the case of the policy name, it's product.dmz as opposed to just DMZ. But other than that, if you remove those two lines or if you just remove the tier and remove product from the name, that policy will be the same for open source for free. Everything about this will work. So as you can see from the screenshot example that I've taken, um, anything that's scoped in the namespace storefront, which was the test application we just introduced, um, in that case, if it has the label um, DMZ for that firewall zone, then I'm allowing it to talk to public internet, which I've actually abstracted a bit where I've said type equals public for that IP range, so that network set. Alternatively, if you're not creating network sets, which we haven't discussed yet, you could just say CIDR match to the IP range. Everything else, as you can see here from an ingress from what we receive, is denied. 
And similarly, what egress, what talks out from that um, DMZ is allowed to talk to pods with the labels firewall zone is trusted and or app equals logging. So notice how there's fine grained, uh, I guess it's Boolean logic we're talking about here. So and or logic. So, you know, we're allowing it to talk to trusted, but rather than creating another rule, we're saying, or if it has app equals logging, or you could say if it's firewall trusted and and app equals logging. So you can define again, fine grained context as for that. If it's not in those permitted zones, as you can see here, the other action is to utter, you know, otherwise den deny that traffic. Um, so that's really powerful. Strongly create, uh, recommend creating something like this for your own workloads, especially if they have similar architecture. So the example I showed there was, yeah, demilitarized the zone. Then we have a trusted zone. Same idea again. Uh, firewall zone is set to trusted, so we know what pods this is going to apply to. It's going to be highly dynamic because even as pods go up and down, they should keep this static firewall zone label. And then we have the rule always stay the same. So it says, allow it to talk to the DMZ. So trust it can talk up to DMZ. Or it can talk, or yes, again, this is ingress. So it's allowed to receive traffic from the DMZ, the one above it. And it's allowed to receive traffic from trusted below it. But if it's not in those two zones, then it's not permitted because it is trusted as the name goes. And then egress, what it talks out, we're allowing it to talk only to restrict it. So pods within the same zone. So it can talk out to pods in the same zone, but anything it's receiving is from those two zones on a relay. And then anything else is denied. So it really is fine grained context here. And then the final one, it seems repetitious, but it's really powerful is to say the last zone is restricted. Then it can also receive tra uh, traffic from the trusted zone or other pods in the restricted zone. Because as we found out, although there's one backend pod with that zone, uh, there may be more pods in the future. So it's important to have that there. Otherwise, if there were more pods, then they couldn't actually you know, receive traffic from one another. Um, and then it's allowing all egress access uh, traffic. That's another point to make. It's allowed any egress traffic out. But of course, if it tried to talk to some other IP range, that would otherwise be blocked by other guardrails we've already configured. Um, so yeah, this is our um, network policy. Um, like I mentioned, it's you're probably getting quite familiar with the idea of deny, allow, logging. Um, if you want to see which policies you've created, um, and again, you may have tiering like we saw with enterprise, then you can say kubectl get network policy for the namespace scope policy, or you can say, and you can see on the right side here, kubectl get global network policy to see which ones are globally scoped. The only reason the syntax is slightly different here is that we have tier dot um policy name which is familiar in calico enterprise but if you're using calico open source it would just be policy name because it doesn't understand this unique construct or concept of tiering um which is not an issue um so to find your policies it's just kubectl get policy uh, or network policy or kubectl get global network policy um for logging and denying actions again just trying to enforce if uh, zero trust like i say strongly recommended for if you've got different environments like you have let's say you have a single cluster but you have some things that you consider like test namespaces or kind of in there even in a production environment it's really important to define what are the purpose and intentions of workloads so like here we've got environmental variable of environment equals prod or environment equals dev and that way in this case if it's a front-end pod it should be so yeah if it's rural front end uh, but it can talk to anything uh, or receive anything from production environments but otherwise uh, it's denying tcp traffic um to prod i think i made a typo there but the point still stands as you can see on the right side view um the development view what we're trying to specify here is even if there's new workloads it's development it could be identical to production one it couldn't hypothetically talk to production and compromise that production because again this is the applications that are being used by our users so it's important to set those guardrails based on intentions as well not just their zones um, so we've gone over the difference between kubernetes and calico network policy calico or kubernetes goes quite far you know it allows us to do ingress egress rules we can specify the pods it already scopes to a namespace there's port matching, TA, you know, protocol traffic matching, even IP blocks. However, when it does come down to 
scoping rich cons uh, you know richly detailed environments then you may also want to have globally scoped policy you may need to explicitly deny or log the traffic to better understand from forensical analysis where that traffic's going and from a you know compliance perspective you may have incompliant users or compliant users that shouldn't be permitted to you know uh, make traffic from workloads to other workloads so having the ability to scope service accounts into those richer matches as well as integrating with the existing service ma uh, mesh if you are using istio and you need to you know understand what is the https layer 7 traffic on top of what we can already scope by default in um our network policy then you can go so much further to get kind of a full scope of what traffic we're going to allow or deny in our environment and sticking on the topic of those uh, traditional firewalling solutions um firewalls are deployed um, enterprise-wide um, they can be quite expensive um, again we're talking about totally free um, open source um, writing in yaml manifest and we gave some simple examples but it, i guess why some organizations still today ask for firewalls and that's absolutely fine it does fall under some regulatory standards is that some of those compliance frameworks they're somewhat archaic you know they've been around for a long time will they change in the time in the future it's hard to know but in the meantime you may still have a firewall solution it needs to sit on the perimeter that's fine you know that's not the discussion we're having here it's more that if you have a traditional firewall that you've invested into and you can't understand it has no visibility of the east west what traffic goes on between pods in the cluster not just goes out of the cluster then it's have no control over that so we have to use policy implementation here and also your security team is centered around those firewalls their concern maybe is you know how much time does it take to start writing network policy because it is a new thing they have to get skilled up and familiar with or maybe your development team need to write policy alongside security and we have yeah, again fine-grained policy which is easy to use it's good to know but if you are looking at potentially talking with about calico enterprise there's web user interface and additional con uh, controls for your security and devops team so that they can work alongside one another but ultimately network policy as you probably could see from the session so far is the de facto way for us to secure east west as well as north south traffic for those pods um yeah existing policy creation process is essentially slow for devops so it needs to be as i say a tool that works alongside security and devops um the devops teams themselves rely on kubernetes to enable agility and speed that's why they're using kubernetes today um that's not a surprise connecting new applications or services um, requires a firewall rule change um, that takes time the idea of our policy being highly dynamic as i mentioned earlier is as new workloads are brought up we don't want to invest time in redesigning the wheel we don't want to spend a lot of time implementing new firewall rule changes based on ip so we can maybe even from the beginning as you have a small environment and as it scales become something quite large or multiple clusters that you can replicate the same policy implementation across multiple distributions multiple different cloud or on-prem bare metal environments um, without any major uh, choke point in that so you know you've got a centralized deployment it's easy to replicate uh, same api for each environment um, and realistic devops can apply this into ci cd pipeline that's probably the most important part that this yaml manifest there's no reason why they can't make these changes at the highest point in the deployment chain so security should never be an afterthought it will always be you know as part of the development or sorry security as code i think is the phrase that people like using but you know use it within your ci cd pipeline for automation um so as we're coming up to an end on this session it's important to know it's not just security it's also compliance you may still be using firewalls for that um, compliance which is totally understandable however if it doesn't maintain the compliance the, the existing firewall investment that it doesn't give us that control it doesn't guarantee for external auditor that we are complying with the east west traffic that's going on in, within our cluster then yeah we need to start really looking into how far can we go with our policy and similarly from an access controls if there are no access controls already for those external resources then we need to do that we need to find 
which pods can talk to external uh, CRDs. And again, what is the ports and protocols that are permitted for those? Um, if there's a lack of visibility, we have enterprise grade offering that's dynamic to give more visibility into it. But either way, um, the policy scoping is, is so well defined. So as long as you write up a good label schema from the beginning, um, you are pretty confident that your policy is working and it's matching what you expect it to. Um, so that's, again, it's trustworthy and uh, it's popular for a reason. So I hope the session was interesting and that you got a lot out of it. Um, as, as you know, it's an open source community. Um, we have an open Slack channel. Uh, we have over 4,000 users in it, um, which is great. Uh, it's always going up. If you have questions about any of the content you've seen today, you can contact, you can reach out to me directly via our Slack community. Uh, the project itself, Calico, has over 150 contributors. So it is worth noting that we have um, the Project Calico GitHub repo. Um, again, you can bring up these discussion points with our developers directly via Slack, via that community, or via discuss.projectcalico.org. Um, the project is widely adopted. I think it's still the most widely adopted um, networking and security um, solution for Kubernetes uh, with over one and a half million nodes powered by Calico every day. So whether you're looking at using our CNI implementation or just the policy that we discussed today, um, you can reach out to us in a bunch of different forms. So hope you had a great session and look forward to hearing from you soon.